Welcome to a Holy Rush Revival. My name is Rob Smith. It's a beautiful night in Mississippi. It's about 75 degrees. Um, October, early, late September, early October. I'm finally getting to where it's good shop nights to work. And I'm not just sweating profusely and having to run fans all the time. As a matter of fact, it's supposed to get down to about 62 tonight. So we might have a pretty good long shop night tonight to enjoy that beautiful cooler weather. So, going to piddle on the old 67 Mustang just a little bit. And uh, to kind of bring you up to speed on where we are, um, been working on the front suspension. You can probably see over there on that side. You might even see some of the old suspension parts in the floor over there. So my goal is, is to work from the tip back this way through the car. And the reason for that is, is I want to get this complete so that I can put my motor transmission together, go ahead and set that in the car, save and spare up a little room in the shop because it's sitting on the motor stand over there and quite frankly my shop isn't big enough so i either need to build a bigger shop or get that engine put in this engine bay and either way it would be a good idea i'd really like the bigger shop to be honest with you but i'm blessed with what i have so for this video this episode we're going to be putting in this uh, fender skirt i thought i was going to get away from having to deal with a lot of this sheet metal that was connected to the firewall. However, you might can see, well, let me, let me stick my finger through it. <laughs> can you see my finger sticking through that hole? Well, that happens to be a hole that the uh, hood hinge attaches to. And I could patch that up. I might could try to fix that up best I could, but that's not a place we need to we need to compromise, if you know what I mean. When you're, when you're dealing with the hood letting up and down and those perfect lines that need to happen on the fender as well as the cow, cow, we don't need any leeway or give in this part of the car. This has got to be good and solid. So again, I thought about piecing it, but I went ahead and ordered this whole fender skirt piece. And it might look relatively easy, but the hard part is going to be the fact that we're going to have to remove the master cylinder, we're going to have to remove the proportioning valve, as well as the steering gearbox, which is okay because I was planning on putting power steering in this car anyway. So that might actually turn into a part of this video where we actually install the power steering gearbox, but I don't know. We'll see what happens when we get there. All right, well... Thank you for watching, and let's get this thing going. Okay, first thing we're going to do is remove the lines, the brake lines from the master cylinder. And this ordinarily would have been a very difficult project if this cow were in place. You might have seen from the opening shot that it looked like I had a cow here. However, I just had these pieces sitting on here uh, to kind of show what it would look like when it, were in there, when it was in there. But, so, you would have to get in the car to disconnect a lot of stuff under here to take the master cylinder out. But without this, man, what a beauty it is to work on right here. But, I got my wrenches and everything ready. And, uh, y'all, if this is the first time even thinking about doing this, these are uh, line wrenches that uh, have that little cut open in for the line. It gives it more bite on the uh, bolt or nut, rather. Uh, to to get out now when you're dealing with brake lines, they're just always rusty uh, Brake fluid is a caustic type fluid and it does cause things to rust and Certainly when it seeps through the joints just a little bit it causes those joints to rust So I don't know if we're gonna be able to salvage these brake lines I would like to because they're very small intricate lines and a little bit difficult to make but if we can't that's perfectly fine We'll just get some more so I put my wrench on here. This one's a 5 8 on the front of this master cylinder. Now, I will tell you that about an hour ago, I put some PB Blaster on these things just to let it kind of soak in and, and, and penetrate. So, let, let's see what happens on the first one. Oh, you're kidding me. Somebody may have been monkeying with that before because it's already loose. <laughs> or that PB Blaster did a good job. I don't know which it is. But... I know you may not be able to see the line is not loose in the fitting. So if I keep turning on this, the line is actually going to break. So I'm going to take a pair of vice grips and gently, gently, I mean very gently, try to hold that line 
without crinching it. Crinch. Is that a is that a southern term? I think it is. Okay, that's gentle pressure. Okay, I, I think it's breaking free from the line. Let me get my wrench on here and get another little bite. Nope. The line is still wanting to turn. I'm afraid it's going to break off. I could put heat on it. Um, hmm. It's not wanting to break free. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to break that line. Because bottom line, <laughs> pun intended, is I don't want those old rusty lines on here anyway. When Mom and I go to do our road trip in this thing, I don't want that to be a, a problem. And wouldn't you know it, I dropped my wrench way down there. All right, let's see if the back one will come loose. Here's my 7 16 3 8 wrench. That is a 3 8 Oh, that, that one turned. Oh, and it's breaking free from the line, so that's good. That one's coming out real easy. wanting to talk that old rust well i guess if it weren't for rust we wouldn't have this channel right holy rust revival <laughs> that one turned all right that's probably enough of watching me get these lines off let me get these lines off and then we'll get my wrenches to actually take the master cylinder out well before we do before i cut to the next shot let's let's look in this master cylinder I have never opened this thing. It is no telling what it's gonna look like in here. Let's try it. Ooh. Yeah. I don't believe we'll be saving this master cylinder. <laughs> let me see if I can get my tripod and bring you up here and let you look in there. Yeah, that's, that's nasty. Well, it's actually still wet though. Look at there. Not so, well, it's, it's wet back there some, but I don't think that's, that's gonna be good. I really don't. That's, that's too nasty looking to, to deal with. Y'all see why I'm having to do what I need to do? This, um, somebody bondoed and, um, cover that up really well. That's why I didn't think originally I was going to need to do much uh, to this panel, but it's kind of hard to really understand what's going on here, but the more you start to pry, look at there, all that Bondo is coming off and revealing what a bad situation we have underneath. So anyway, might have covered that up really, really well. But this is that hole I was telling you about that the hood hinge went into. And we just don't need that to be weak right there. And there might be other issues down there, so we're just going to go ahead and replace the whole thing. Now, here's those lines that I was telling you about earlier. I was able to crack this one. I was not able to get that one loose without twisting the line. But I got it loose down here. And I got this line loose, and there's two more underneath that I were able to, that I was able to get loose without messing them up. So that is absolutely amazing that one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brake line connections here that I was only ha had one that um, was actually stove up. But anyway, I also went on ahead and took the bolts out. I, didn't, I know you didn't want to just watch me take bolts out. The two that are holding it to the firewall. And then you get off down in here and get where you can see this is actually where the master cylinder connects to the brake pedal. So if I jiggle the brake pedal, when you push the brake pedal down, it pushes 
this rod in, which goes into the master cylinder and squeezes the juice in there and sends it to the brakes and makes the brakes happen on the wheels. That is a great explanation, isn't it? And don't you just love dirt daubers? That was a nice one. Nice nest right there. All right, let me post the camera back up and I'll take the master cylinder out as well as the proportioning valve, those two things. Okay, everything should be loose. That line is loose. Oh, it's just coming out of there so easy. Okay, that is a 67 Mustang dual reservoir master cylinder. It's froze up like, like Fort Knox. I mean, it's not going to move. It's not going to budge. We're just going to have to replace that whole thing right there. Because i got to keep Mama safe, you know. And that, that will keep Mama safe replacing that. All right. Proportioning valve. It was kind of sort of not wanting to come out a minute ago, and I put some penetrating oil on it. There's a nut on the back side of the fender that I took off. I'm just going to keep wiggling it. By the way, there's two fish in a tank. One looked at the other and said, hey, how you drive this thing? <laughs> that was a good dad joke I heard today. All right, come on, come on, baby. You've been in there for 50 years? Yeah, you need to come out. It's time. It's time. Ooh, there she is. Ah, so what that does is that um, differentiates the pressure between the front and the back. You need a little more braking in the front than you do the back. This thing had drum brakes all the way around, and when we go back, we're going to have disc brakes on the front, drum brakes on the back. So I'm probably going to have to put a different proportion valve in anyway. But this one, the um, front brakes came out here. The two master cylinder lines go in here. This is the input from the master cylinder. Fluid goes that way. And it comes out here to the front brakes. And these two lines... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll take that back. No, no, that's right. This one's front brakes. And this one is rear brakes. This one and this one are front brakes. That's the rear brakes. The rear brakes only have one line. The front has two. And it's those two right there. So... Whenever the fluid comes in, it sends a certain amount of pressure to the back, and then it sends a certain amount of pressure to the front, and it equalizes things so that your front tires won't lock up versus your rear tires in certain situations. It all has even braking power all the way through, if that makes sense. Okay, what's next? I think we're gonna have to pull the steering column next. That's gonna be fun. Yep, yep, yep. Boy, starting to sound like an old man. Did you notice when I bent down on my knees, that grunt came out? <laughs> I guess the older you get, the, the worse that gets. Anywho, um, the next thing we got to do is take the steering wheel off because the steering shaft right here in the middle is connected all the way into the steering gearbox down there and the column itself has got to slide off of that shaft. In order for that to slide off the shaft, the steering wheel has got to come off. Let's see how difficult the steering wheel is gonna be. All right, that's a, oh, gone. Got the wrong side socket. No, here's the right one. Right here. 15 sixteenths. Oh yeah, that fits better. This might be a knuckle buster. <laughs> that was a little too easy. I'm not real concerned about this steering wheel because I'm going to be replacing it. As you can tell, it's cracked a good bit. I don't know what's under this here, so I'm going to bump it some and see if it'll come loose. Chances are it's been on there 50 years and it's not going to want to come off. This is a dead blow hammer that'll maybe protect it a little bit, but give it a good dead blow. Let's see what happens. <laughs> a 
You know what that is? That just popped out of this hole right here. That's the uh, light that tells you to put your seat belts on. That was actually a $12 option back in 1967. And by the way, it was 66, 67 where seat belts were first required to be put in cars by the federal government. And uh, that was a nice little accessory. That was a $12 accessory. Let's put that right back there because we'll need to get that working again. Okay, all right, it's not gonna, it's not going to budge. I'm gonna have to go get a steering wheel puller. Let me go get all that and we'll be back. Okay. All right, let's get that light down there. Probably a little glare on the camera. All right, let's try to set this puller up. So this is just a steering wheel puller. I think I picked this thing up at a garage sale for a few dollars. A lot of times folks will uh, use one and they only need it for a specific purpose and then they don't need it again. So they end up just kind of so either putting it back way back in the toolbox or selling it in a garage sale at some point. Okie dokie. Let's uh, screw this bad boy in just a little bit. There's two threaded holes in the steering column that these bolts are supposed to go in. And, hmm, my, my, my actual bolts are different. A lot of times when you use pullers, you end up bending your bolts and you put them back in the bag and think, well, I'll replace that before I do the next project. Well, guess what? The next project comes up and you still have the old bolt in the bag and they're different sizes and you know, that's just the way it is. One's a little bit longer than the other. Let me screw it in a little more. Okay. Now. See if we can center that steering column. See if that will start pulling. And here's this three quarter, three quarter. Yep, that's it. I don't really like what's happening here. The center of my bolt is on the side of the shaft. But let's see if it'll. Well, look at there. It worked. It worked. It came off. I was kind of thinking I might be boogering up that thread, but I didn't. <laughs> My word. Look at all the dirt daubers in there. They just, they're just relentless. They don't know when to quit, do they? All right, all right, we'll deal with that later. Next thing I've got to do is get under here and pull this wiring harness loose. There's a few bolts that are holding the column into the firewall, and there's a bolt or two right here. And I know you want to watch all that. You don't want to see a fat man on his belly <laughs> getting under the uh, firewall. So I'm going to do myself a favor, and I'm going to do yourself a favor and uh, cut the video right here, pull this wiring harness loose, get those bolts loose, and then we'll slip that on out. All right, y'all, before we pull this column out, I might wanna get personal for just a second. There, there's other reasons why I have shop nights, and one of those reasons is to relieve stress. It is a stress reliever for me. <laughs> Some of you might go, well, doggone, it looks like it's creating a lot of stress, but for me, this this clears my mind. It it, it gets, I don't know, it just, it, I can focus on this. I can leave the, the troubles of the daily work behind. And this has been a, a very difficult season for me. Um, exciting, but difficult and, and rewarding at the same time. 
See, I've I'm, I'm been, plan been planning for 15 months um, a, a career technical center that will basically put in a lot of trades classes. This kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> similar to, to this. Uh, it, it's turned out to be a, a rather expensive project, and our school board decided that we need to do a school bond in order to finish off the construction of this and, and put it together and get it going fully and efficiently all at one time. And uh, I don't know, y'all. I, I know it's hard. It's hard when you have to go to the public and ask for, you know, an increase in taxes. And I don't enjoy paying taxes. Honestly, I've got a lot of land and I've got two or three houses and it's, it's a burden paying all those taxes. I, I probably pay, I'd say probably around $6,000 in taxes every year, not including payroll taxes, all that other kind of stuff. That's just, just property taxes. Uh, it, I've had to get to it in my mind is this. Our children are worth it. Our children are worth that extra 50 bucks or so a month or a year to, um, to, to do this, depending on what your property value is of your house, of course. But the problem has been facing the opposition, so to speak, um, and I get it. I get it. Everything that is said and everything that is brought up, I completely understand and my heart bleeds. And at the end of the day, when I look at that person and, I, and I'm standing and I've been engaged in town hall meetings and whatnot, um, there's been some dicey moments, but I can look past, look past the opposition and, and keep my eyes on the number one goal. And that's doing what's best for students. But also I can't lose the fact that I'm a child of God. And they are a child of God. And I can't say or do anything that would destroy that relationship or that witness, even though the opposition is coming at me in my face. I've got to be strong. You know, that's what Jesus did. Um, he knew he had a vision. He knew he had a purpose. And God put him on this planet for a purpose, to save us from our sins. And he knew the ultimate cost of what it was going to take to do that. And he went to the cross anyway. And can you imagine the ridicule and shame and everything that went into the process of making that happen? And look, I'm not putting myself in those shoes. He died for me in my unperfect, imperfect self, okay? And I am so grateful for that. And if I can just at least in some way be a, be a reflection of that, because he is Lord and Savior of my life, and I've got to be that reflection of him to others. That's the only way... Sometimes the gospel can be spread, and I'm telling you, it's difficult um, when you're faced with those trials. But I will say in the last three or four weeks through this process of the bond election, town halls, all that kind of stuff, I have made more friends. Friends that came to be opposition to begin with, and probably still some relationships and friends to be made after it's all said and done. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the path that God has has put me in. I'm thankful and humbled that he put me in this position to be able to create programs to help students find their passion. Y'all may not know it, but we've got a lot of students that are um, basically living off video games when they go home. That, that's all that's feeding them when they go home. They don't get out and enjoy, you know, working with their hands and finding that passion. And until somebody sits them down, puts them in a pathway that helps them put their hands on things and experience things and let that light bulb come on in their head, some may never get it. Some may get it. Some may get it later. But we can't afford to let our youth uh, waste away. So y'all pray for me. That's all I'm asking. Uh, it's, it's a challenging time, and, but I'm thankful for how God has worked in and through it. All right, let's pull this steering column out. So I've taken these two bolts out. I've taken four bolts down there. I had to take the blinker assembly out. There's a, it was just easier because there's a, like a, I don't know, that's a brass washer that fits down there that makes this get loose. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to push down and start pulling out. And there it is. <laughs> there's the steering column. 
Now, one problem with a 67 Mustang, this, this shaft is a direct connection right into that gearbox down there. This is the most dangerous part of this car. Th this, is, this is a spear that if you have a front end collision here and that box crumples, that spear is gonna go into your chest. And there's no way to disconnect this from the outside out there. So when I put this column back, we're gonna put a rag joint. It's basically gonna be a, we're gonna cut this shaft and put a rag joint in there so that if there ever is a front end collision, that rag joint will break and tear before this goes into your chest. That's just another one of those ways that we're gonna to try to keep mama safe. All right, the next thing we gotta do is take the actual gearbox off on the outside and we'll just about be clear to get to the actual project they're supposed to be working on. All right. All right, so here's the other side or shot of that uh, shaft. You can actually see the end of the shaft. Excuse me, we were looking at just a minute ago. Comes all the way through and down into this steering gearbox. And what we've got to do now is you'll see some bolts right here. They're actually on the other side of the, the frame rail. We're going to pull those bolts out. And this tie rod, uh, I put that new end on there recently. You may have seen that video. Uh, but I just screwed that on there. Uh, that, that'll that just screw right off and pop off. Otherwise, if you were doing it in your car, you would have to get a crow's foot. It's kind of like a fork. And stick it in there and hammer, pop that off. Because it's usually pretty wedged in there. But this one actually will just fall off because I didn't even put pressure on it. All right, let me get around to the other side and take those bolts out. All right. So I did get the bolt started, put penetrating oil on them, like I said, a couple hours ago. So they're coming out relatively easy, but there's three of them here. These are the three that holds the gearbox on on the other side. Some of you may wonder, Rob, why don't you use an impact? I do have an impact. It's right over there in that drawer. But you remember that stress reliever I was telling you about? This is all part of the process. Yeah, get a little workout on the arms. Get the blood flowing. You know, just keep the old fella moving. I hear it moving over there. These bolts are threaded into the actual gearbox itself, so there's no nut on the other side. It's actually threaded straight into the gearbox. That's loud, sorry. Here's one. Looks pretty nasty, doesn't it? That's been in there quite a few years. What are the chances that gearbox is gonna fall off on the floor? Oof, I heard it. I heard it fall. That one's pretty nasty. Oop, I heard something fall, didn't you? All right, let me get the camera back around on the other side. Okay, looks like she's about ready to fall out on the floor. So, let's see, here we go. Look at there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there. All right. So that's a steering gear box set up. Do you see that spear that I was telling you about? You can't really understand it fully until you've got the whole thing in your hand. But that, that's a solid shaft. Right here is where we're going to cut the shaft that I was telling you about earlier and put that rag joint in. And that'll go into the new power steering gear box that we're going to put in the car. Just be a much safer setup. Okay, let's 
Set this down. <laughs> yee -hoo. Okay. We're getting our panel a little clear so we can start doing some work. It's, uh, I might. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and take these lines loose. Get them out of the way. Get this electrical line out of the way. And then, I might just have to get the old plasma cutter out. And just start going to town. Okay, y'all. Got my trusty plasma cutter out there. And what I'm going to attempt to do is to kind of plasma cut around some of these edges and get the big part out and then come back with a chisel, hammer chisel, and get out the edges and clean it up so we can put the new panel in. So I'm going to go to the other side and start blowing away with a plasma cutter. And I hope I don't get too many sparks on you. If they come your way, duck. Big hole. What I'm going to do now is start 
start cleaning these edges out because all of that stuff is spot welded in spot welded on the firewall down here and across so we'll start drilling out some spot welds and then get an air chisel Let's see if i can't help that just a little bit there we go air compressor went off i hope you heard everything i just said if not there you go okay let me pull you in here and show you a little something first thing i did i made some marks with a paint pen just to kind of know where the edge of this old piece was so i can put the new one back in the exact same place but the other thing i did is i had a spot weld cutter that i cut out around the edge of these spot welds this is what it looks like it's just a little tiny hole saw is all it is and I just basically stuck it right there and drilled out around the edge now now hold your ears okay chisel now put it in there ah, great air compressor came on too but you get my drift about what's happening Peeling right off. Peeling right off. Okay. All right, I can't do this with one hand. So I just wanted to get, help you understand the gist of how to pull that old sheet metal off. As you can see, it's already separating. And I'm going to do that all the way around until I get all the old stuff off. Okay, y'all, through the magic of YouTube, I've done a lot of cleaning up. All of this is now off. All of the old pieces off here, as well as up all the way through here. Still got to work on this, but I'm going to show you something in a second. I do have some rusty places here I've got to work with. I've got a little place in the firewall here that's a hole. However, the new floor pan that I'm going to put in will come all the way up to there, and that'll take care of that. Let me get you around here to the other side. You can see a little bit better shot of what is cleaned up. All of the rough edges are off. I'm gonna have to come back and clean these spots up and treat that rust. But let me show you something I noticed before I just started ripping all this off, and I'm glad I didn't just, you know, take all that off before. The new panel that I'm going to be putting in, as you can see here, uh, it, it does not have, see it's flat, smooth right there. Let me put this down. So this is the bolt hole for the fender. The front fender goes on, and that does not have that hole in there. So, I'm going to have to use this as a template. As you can see, it's just about ready to come off. But that's where it is in its stock location. So, I want to kind of protect this integrity for just a minute. So, I took my tape measure and I measured from the back of this hole to the back of this hole. And I wrote it down right here. It's eight and a half inches from back to back of hole. So that when I, I rip this off, I will know a measurement from here to there, and I can put this piece on the new one, mark out a template for these holes so that they can make sure that they're in the right place. So, I just wanted to show you that. Always when you're doing this, pay attention to your new panels versus old because sometimes there's, there's differences there, and you need to pay attention while you still have the integrity of, of the right marks. All right, let me chew on this a little bit, get this out, and I'll bring you back in in a minute. Right, Y'all, I've gotten the grinding wheel after the joint there, and uh, got it as shiny metal as I could. Yeah, here's the first glance of the fender skirt in place. Now, it is by no means pushed up perfect. I've just got it sitting in there for you to be able to see. I know I'm going to have to do a little trimming in this corner down here, 
maybe a little trimming down here to get it to go back smoothly, but you can kind of see what's, what's happening now. All right, over here, the discussion we were having previously, this is that area that I showed you that was rusted right in here. I'm fixing to have good metal on top of that. It's gonna be able to weld really good on all four corners. And by the way, this is gonna to have to be trimmed all the way down through. So they give you plenty of extra here to make sure that you're matching up like need be. So I, I, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do here. It's a little dark back here, but you can, you can see how it's meeting up. As I said, I don't have it pushed all the way up yet. It's just sitting in there to eyeball. But it's not bad. Not bad. It's awfully nice out here. It's probably in the low 60s now. Just perfect temperature and weather for a shop night. But feller's tired. And uh, it's midnight. Well, actually probably 1230. Uh, I need to get some beauty rest. I mean, look. <laughs> wouldn't you agree? Um, I'm going to treat some rust, do some rust treatment here. And go on ahead and let that dry overnight and go on ahead and get some rest and then come back and, and weld this in. So I'm going to clean my tools up for the night, kind of get myself organized, get some rest, and we'll come back and finish this project before this weekend is over. Good night. All right, y'all. Hey, uh, <laughs> I told you good night the other night, um, but actually it's been four nights since I have last talked to you. There's been a lot happen. In the last couple of days, my brother Jonathan Smith came to town. Um, that's a whole nother story we could get into later. There might be some rust revivals on that one as a result, um, using equipment and all that. Uh, but anyway, getting back to it. It's about middle of the week, the week after I shot that video. So, what I have done, I have taken our panel and I have trimmed the sides and edges and uh, got it to fit in the hole, and I've marked some little holes here to drill, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And I'll be honest with you, I'm having a little hard time getting my train of thought together this morning because my beautiful wife is behind the camera, beautiful wife, and I'm distracted greatly at this very moment. But she did tell me not to turn the camera around, and, and I'm gonna do exactly what my wife says, okay? But if I look like I'm smiling a little bit extra or maybe have this little glimmer in my eyes because <laughs> as I'm looking at you, I'm looking at her. And oh man, what an apple she is to my eye. Are you sure you don't want to turn the camera around? I'm very sure. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, maybe later. Well, there you go. Maybe later. All right, so what I'm about to do is pull this panel out. Like I said, I've already got it trimmed to fit. We're going to drill some holes and get it ready to spot weld with our, our welder and get this thing put in and we will land this train and get this video done. All right, y'all, as you can see, I've just kind of marked holes. They're not perfect. Even from the factory when they spot welded all of this in, it was not perfect. It was just always left up to wherever the person put it. They didn't measure it out and make it perfect. And today's probably, there's robots that do that, robots that actually you know, do the spot welding in cars, so it will be a little more perfect than it was back in 1967. So I'm simply going to drill out some of these holes so that I can get uh, my MIG welder in there and start my puddle in the middle of the hole and work it out and weld it in. It'll look just like a spot weld, even though it's not. <laughs> So I've got the spot welds drilled out, got it clamped down, and I also have it spot welded on the back. I, I used a kind of a pole to push and keep this down tight while I spot welded on the back. So it's in there firm at this moment, but to solidly weld it up, I'm going to go in and hit these uh, spot welds. Now this is not how the factory did it. Uh, they used a spot weld machine that just basically went in there and clamped all these and sent electricity to it and spot welded it in. But we're at a farm boy shop, so this is how farm boys have to do it, because every farm boy doesn't have a spot welding machine in his uh, inventory. So, 
I'm gonna take my MIG welder, start my puddle in the middle of one of these little holes, and um, fill it in. It's gonna look, look and behave just like a spot weld. Okay, I'm gonna do you a favor and cut the camera off because the big fat boy is gonna have to get in the car to get in there to weld all of this up. And then my beautiful assistant is gonna come back and help uh, tape some of this. So uh, again, I may get burned because I'll be distracted from looking at my beautiful assistant, but that's okay. That will be perfectly fine because a burn is very well worth that, absolutely. Okay, so you can see how basically I've drilled inside that hole. I started with my puddle in the middle and worked my way out to the hole. And it's got fastened to both the bottom metal and the top metal is fastened in. So that's pretty much how a, a farm boy, plow boy spot well works. Now granted, it doesn't look great now, but I'll come back with the grinder and uh, grind it down smooth and flat. And you won't be able to tell the difference between any of these other spot welds that came from the factory. Okay, <laughs> come on in here and let's look at some things. So, spent some time welding up all of those spot welds down through there, all across the bottom, all across the top, on the firewall. But we're just gonna wrap this thing up. We gotta land this train quick because I'll tell you why in just a minute. But I put the gearbox in, look at there. That's the Borgeson power steering gearbox. We're gonna be replacing the manual gearbox to this power steering box and I want you to see something that's the rag joint that I was telling you about earlier that if we do have a front-end collision say we hit here and the power goes through here gets to the gearbox and gets to that joint can you see that it's got rubber it's got rubber in that joint and supposedly that's going to help soften the blow of a front-end collision as well as maybe tear before the steering shaft goes into your chest up there. All of your modern cars have this rag joint in there. Um, it's all your antique cars that have that solid shaft and that is just really a, a great and wonderful upgrade that you can do to keep yourself safe in these old cars. So anyway, let me show you this. This, <laughs> this is the whole reason why we replaced all of that. I now have a great mounting point for the hood hinge, whereas before I did not. It was rusted really bad in this area. So now that hood hinge is just as tight and steady as it can be. It's not gonna move. It's not gonna cause the crack in the hood to be uh, different. So that's why all of this happened right here. Now I'm not completely done. I've got to trim this off, and as you can see, I've got some rust right here I've got to deal with. So I didn't weld, I probably there's a piece of my welding rod there. I welded from here down, because I'm going to have to come in and put a, a plate or something in here and then fix this up. Th this is going to take a little work, but once I get this fixed and I put the cowl on, nobody will ever see this again unless they're just laying on their head specifically looking up back behind that and that that's never going to happen this is this is really no man's land right here so we'll fix this i plan on fixing this and welding into all of this over here on the side and making it look a lot better any who's okay y'all have a little bonus footage remember i told you the whole reason we did that panel there was to put the hood hinge on well, my assistant here was helping me to, was here helping me today, so uh, we actually put the hood on. And uh, about a month ago, I drove eight hours to the other side of Atlanta to find this hood, and this hood has the blinker inserts in it. So I was real anxious to get the hood on. 
but, but watch this, watch this. I've only adjusted for about 30 minutes. It's not perfect, but the classic Mustang hood, just listen to it. Woo, isn't that pretty? Oh, it's just nothing like the hood slamming on an old classic car. Let's do it one more time. Even the sound of the spring, I mean, that's, some of you have old Mustangs, you hear that spring going, and you know, that's, that's just an old Mustang. <laughs> well, I still have a little adjustment to do with the hinge. It's not hitting exactly right. But the reason I'm doing that is so that, remember this cowl that we put in? I just got it sitting in here. So I'm going to line the, the fenders up, and then I'm going to line the hood up, and then from that I'll be able to line this cowl up very perfectly. Come right here, Lori, and see, see this line. This is the line I'm trying to to line up perfectly with the hood and it's not bad right now it's not it's a little close and tight on that side a little bit a little bit wide over here but that's all part of the process of getting all these panels to line up so there you go there's a little <laughs> extra footage to show the reason why we put that hinge on and fix that that part of the hinge that that hood is going to let up and down perfectly from now on we're going to stop this video at this point because my wife and I are heading to the Blue Ridge Parkway. We're going to go to Rockfish, Virginia, hit the Blue Ridge Parkway and ride all the way down the Blue Ridge Parkway to Cherokee, North Carolina. We have been saying for at least a decade that one of these days we're going to take off and see the pretty fall leaves. And believe it or not, it's, it's in the 80s here. I've been looking at the weather forecast in some places on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it's supposed to be to 32 some nights in 50s and 60s during the day. <laughs> this Mississippi boy is so excited about that. I didn't even pack a long sleeve shirt because if it got down to 32 one night, I will be just happy. It'll take a week for me to get cold after having been in Mississippi heat all summer. So look, let me, oh, well, let me give a shout out. Tristan, my biggest fan, Tristan Smith. That's my nephew. I always want to give a shout out to him. Oh, let me give you a dad joke. I, I don't know if I got one in this episode. I can't remember. What does a carpenter do when he gets nervous? <laughs> he bites his nails. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, okay, all right. Well, never mind. Well, Tristan, I love you. Everybody else, love you too. Hope you enjoy this uh, episode of Holy Rust Revival. I think our next project is going to be this cow. I've got to tackle it, and it's got to it's got to happen if we're going to make progress on this car. So I'm still scratching my head a little bit as to where to go there, but we'll figure it out. All right, God bless. Mm -hmm.